Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming uh, to our uh, Mansfield Center Brown Bag. Uh, we have a, an exciting speaker and an exciting presentation today. Uh, before I get started, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, we'll be filming this. L MCAT will be filming this, and through a generous grant through MCAT, uh, we'll be uh, uh, having this uh, available to our public uh, later on. Um, uh, with that, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Professor Eric Schlussel. I think many of you know uh, Eric. Uh, he is our newest addition to the East Asian Studies program, uh, but also at the History Department and the Political Science Department. And also uh, the Mansfield Center is uh, very proud to have him as a, an important affiliate uh, to our program. Talking not only about, about uh, China, but also its relationship with Central Asia. Uh, and so he is not only uh, uh, a country specialist, but also uh, an important regional expert that we desperately need here at the University of Montana. And today, no doubt, is it's a great way for him to start off his career at uh, the University of Montana by talking about the Uyghurs, uh, which, as many of you know, uh, have an interesting history and relationship with, with China, uh, and, and it's an essential part of China's relationship with Central Asia. Uh, uh, Dr. Schlussel comes to us from Harvard, uh, recently got his PhD in the History Department, and I'm sure he'll have some opportunity to introduce a little bit about his background, a very fascinating background. Uh, but with that, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Eric up and to begin his presentation on uh, controlling leader bodies, the new colonial project in Chinese Central Asia. Eric. Thank you, Abe, for that effusive and inaccurate introduction. I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, it's wonderful being here. Thanks to the Mansfield Center for uh, bringing me in and making me part of their community. It's been a, an amazing first semester here at UM. Uh, I do love it here in Missoula. And uh, thank you all so much for coming this afternoon. It's wonderful to see this many new faces in the crowd. Um, so I'll just get to it then. Uh, yeah, my topic for discussion for today is the government of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region uh, here in Western China, the big orange blob. Uh, now, a typical lecture on this topic would tell you a few basic things. Uh, first, Xinjiang is a distinct political unit within the Chinese state. It's an autonomous region, uh, similar to the isn't Tibetan and Mongol autonomous regions and others, where uh, legally, at least, the titular nationality, the Uyghur people, have the right to develop their language and culture independently. Second, the Uyghur or Uyghur people in Uyghur uh, include about 9 to 11 million uh, Central Asian Muslims who speak a Turkic language, completely different from Chinese. Uh, I spent quite a great deal of time in Xinjiang learning Uyghur. Uh, and getting deeply into society and history of the region. It's a particular specialty of mine. Um, and third, a typical lecture about Xinjiang would discuss the ongoing project to develop the region's economy through energy, exploitation, infrastructural links between China and Central Asia, all the way to Turkey, and, of course, tourism. And you would hear about how the government has sponsored millions of Han Chinese migrants from central China to move into the region since the 1980s, and how these migrants benefit far more from economic development than Uyghurs do. An especially good presentation would address the fraught consequences of Xinjiang's normalization and integration into the broader Chinese political, economic, and social systems. These are all things you could read about. Now, today is a brown bag, and to me that means experiments. Do something a little different. Um, and so, while I started out in things like policy and anthropology, I end up in history. And part of today's talk is really going to be how a historian like me, versed in the pre-modern political tradition of China, understands a set of policies and practices in the modern state that, at first blush, seem absolutely absurd. And yet, these absurdities are central to the incorporation and normalization of Xinjiang and its people into the Chinese state. And so we'll begin with an incident, gosh, almost two years ago, that first got me interested. On February 8, 2015, at 4 in the morning, which is early on a good day, in front of the great festival mosque of Kashgar, you see it in the back there, it's been there 
since I believe the 1400s. 10,000 people gathered on this great expanse of pavement that used to be the mosque's flower garden. This is in the city of Kashgar, on the western end of the People's Republic of China, on the western end of Xinjiang. Now, Kashgar, in terms of its sights, smells, its majority Sunni uh, Muslim population following the Hanafi madhab of Islamic jurisprudence, resembles Pakistan far more than it does Beijing. Kashgar, the city here, is known today as the cultural capital of the Uyghur people. So it's a very significant site, religiously and culturally. However, the thousands who lined up in front of the mosque were not there for morning prayers. Instead, their work units had sent them to participate in an exercise meant to contribute to ongoing anti-extremism efforts. The Chinese state has been increasingly concerned by what it construes as extremism, which we might think of as radical Islamic terrorism. However, extremism is defined in the context of Xinjiang in somewhat different terms, as we will see. In order to, to combat extremism, these 10,000 Muslims gathered together on this grand stretch of pavements, and a loudspeaker began to play a song. That song was the Little Apple Song. I don't know if you've heard of this. The Little Apple Song? Right, OK, so Little Apple Song is basically a Chinese macarena. It's an annoying little pop song. It has a slightly risque video attached to it, which comes from a comedy film. Um, I was going to play it for you, but technical difficulties. Uh, this was a fad back in 2013, 2014, Xiaopingguo. Everyone was dancing Xiaopingguo. You have a little line dance associated with it. And in Kashgar on that bitterly cold morning, the Little Apple Song was the main event. Thousands of people broke out into the Little Apple Dance. Notice that most of them are wearing red, partly because this is the color of China and of communism, but also because this is an anti-extremism event and a patriotic event. But it was also, by the way, a celebration of the Chinese New Year. And here we have, well, Uyghurs being Muslims do not typically celebrate Chinese New Year. But here we have hundreds of them from different work units dressed up in sort of mockeries of traditional Chinese clothing, playing drums, celebrating the arrival of a Lunar New Year. Um, and if you look closely at those signs in the back, here, a row of, again, Uyghurs sent out by their work units hold signs in Chinese saying, construct a harmonious Kashgar. This is a propaganda slogan. Now again, legally, this is an autonomous region. All signage is supposed to be bilingual. But of course, none of this was in Uyghur. It's only in Chinese. Now, people have been dressed according to their work units to show their uniformity within certain, uh, certain structures. In the back, some people were out of uniform because they weren't necessarily the most enthusiastic participants. So here we have a Xinhua news agency photo of one of several hundred imams and mullahs. Now in China, imams and mullahs must be part of the official state Islamic association and trained in state madrasas, state uh, Islamic schools. Um, and here they are required to participate in the Little Apple Dance. Uh, apparently not having a very good time. Uh, this event, as you can tell, was very, very heavily covered by the media, right, as a display of patriotism, because the Little Apple Dance had been construed as a patriotic song. Ai guo ge qiu. Why is the Chinese Macarena a patriotic song, and why were 10,000 people dancing it in front of the mosque in Kashgar? This really got me curious. Well, this wasn't the beginning of it. A month earlier in uh, Turpan, another city in Xinjiang, another group of imam was performing the Little Apple as a patriotic song. Um, in these photos from Pezawat, which is a, a very poor area east of Kashgar, you can see the Little Apple dance is again part of a mass demonstration coordinated by local government, performed for the public and the media under rows of Chinese flags. If you look at the images the media have chosen, they're focusing on women who are wearing brightly colored dresses. Keep that image in your mind. We'll come back to it at the end of the talk. There's a reason they're focused on women wearing brightly colored silk dresses. The Little Apple Dance in Kashgar was the culmination of a process. Work units across southern Xinjiang had been assigned to perform the Little Apple Dance, to do so publicly, 
and to contribute to the building of patriotic feeling by doing so en masse. When a state and its various local organs require this many people to get up at the crack of dawn and dance a pop dance, when significant public resources go into a vast coordinated dance competition, this should invite some serious questions about that state's priorities and about how the people who govern understand their tasks and their methods of achieving them. But what does the government of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region try to accomplish by organizing public mass Little Apple dances? Now, as David Brophy has rightly argued in a piece on the China story, people were not overtly coerced into dancing the Little Apple. However, as anyone knew, the song had been declared patriotic. So refusing to participate in these work unit dances would mean that you were not patriotic. It might imply a protest, however subtle, against the Chinese state, and thus get you in a great deal of trouble. So the Little Apple Dance, because it's so absurd, ridiculous, is in some ways a test of state power. See if we can get people to do this. Are they loyal enough? Are they afraid enough to do whatever we ask of them? And it's also a way to see who was, being, who was loyal by seeing who would be willing to participate. So uh, online testimony from various corners uh, supports this interpretation. For example, here's a web user from Pezawat posting that his older brother's wife has some sort of difficulty with her arm. The phrasing is fairly ambiguous. And so she did not participate in the Little Apple Dance at her work unit. A few days later, the local party cadre, that's a local official from the party, came with the police and seized the older brother, telling him that your wife did not participate in Little Apple. And so he was taken away to a re-education center. It's effectively a euphemism for a prison with heavy ideological content um, for several months. So OK, there's an instrumental reason for the Little Apple Dance. It might be just about power. It might be a sort of cynical way of seeing if you can turn people into puppets and organize their movements. But I think there's more to it than that. Why was dancing so important to begin with? This is an absurd thing for a modern state to be involved in, or so it would seem. OK. You might not know this, but being a good Confucian, a good cultural Chinese elite, involved a certain amount of dancing. Here we see Neo-Confucian students in the Qing Dynasty. This is a manual for how to dance out a passage from the Chinese classics in a ritual setting. The best students from schools were often assigned to be ritual dancers at temples. You form your body into the shape of a certain Chinese character, meaning uh, longevity, loyalty, filial piety. And you do so en masse with other students to show your common harmony. Um, dances like these came out of a tradition of disciplining one's body movements in order to alter the heart and the mind within. The idea being that one's comportment was a critical part of one's social identity and of learning to interact with others in correct and harmonious ways. In Chinese, this tradition is called li. And li is hard to translate because it includes proper rituals. So some translate as rituals or rites. But the elite conception of li, which I'm skipping over a lot of history here, really informs how the Chinese state deploys it from the mid-19th century onward is really focused on locating people in a certain social and cosmic position. By comporting yourself in the correct way, by interacting with others according to the norms of the system of Li codified 2,500 years ago in the classics, you accept and you act out a position that is harmonious with society and that puts you in your proper place in the state as well. We might compare the notion to Foucauldian ideas of discipline. But in some ways, it also resembles an intervention in the sociocultural process of distinction or class distinction that Bourdieu describes. So there's my theoretical point. This emphasis on bodily comportment and performance was very much in evidence in Maoist political culture as well. So students of the Cultural Revolution are likely familiar with the loyalty dance, or literally the zhong zi wu, the loyalty character dance wherein the dancers stretched out their arms, forming themselves into the character for loyalty, Zhong, while praising Chairman Mao. Mass dancing emerged in the same era as a state-coordinated performance of the will of the masses. It looks like a popular demonstration, but it's created by the state as a kind of recuperation. It's as though 
the whole will of the masses is being expressed in a harmonious outpouring of feeling, shown in their movements, their common harmony, and their harmony with the state. Now, I won't linger on this because good scholarship on post-1949 Nance is really just emerging. So wait for Emily Wilcox's forthcoming book, Revolutionary Bodies. I'd recommend it. However, I will say that if we read these mass state dances through the notion of Li, we will see that they're meant to interpolate or place the individual into a certain kind of mass subjectivity by making them perform identical choreographed ritual movements. Group dancing has recently had a major resurgence as a grassroots form of popular entertainment in mainland China. Now, if you've been to China the past several years, you know this. Aunties, older women, tend to go out in the evening and they're known for flooding city squares and doing mass line dancing. This can be annoying if you live near a square. Regulations have recently gone to place in many cities uh, regulating the maximum volume at which they're allowed to play their line dancing music. Uh, the government has gotten even more involved, not just by supporting square dancing, but by issuing regulations and suggestions as the form and content of the dances. They've produced official dances that you're supposed to do as loyal Chinese citizens. Um, nominally, the reason for this intervention is to incorporate square dancing into a program for national health and fitness. All right, fair enough. It's, sometimes the Chinese state sticks its fingers into every possible form of mass organization. That's one of the lessons you learn about modern China. The state doesn't like competitors. Even if it's a bunch of aunties dancing the square, that is meant to be subject to some degree of regulation because it's free association and goodness knows what it could lead to. Uh, see also the 1997 crackdown on soccer matches in Xinjiang. So the question remains, why Little Apple? Why patriotic? Why then? Why there? And why for these people? Why for Uyghurs specifically? This has to do with something I like to call sinonormativity. I think I coined this term. I said today it would be experimental. The term sinonormativity is a play on the term heteronormativity. It's by sinonormativity, I mean a basic socio-political stance or outlook that promotes or assumes a, an idea of essential Chinese-ness, whatever that might be. Now, everyone has a different idea of what being Chinese means. Within Han Chinese population, there's tremendous variation in language, culture, outlook. Everyone has a different ideal in their heads of what it means to be Chinese. A further problem arises when, in trying to create good members of the Chinese state, so Chinese as Chinese citizens, officials assume that to be a good citizen means to conform to some conception, however nebulous, of Chinese behavior that is implicitly, ethnically Han Chinese specifically. They would assume that to be a good person is to embody the specific traits, behaviors, and attitudes that one might think typify the ethnic majority. It's a kind of common sense. You forget that there are non-Han out there. You forget that other people have different ideas of what it might be to be Chinese. So you say, ah, everyone's like this. Everyone enjoys a little apple dance. Everyone likes karaoke. Everyone likes this kind of food. The Chinese state does not explicitly say that its goal is to create a Han Chinese nation state. Nominally, the People's Republic of China is a multi-ethnic state that enshrines in its constitution protections for uh, every ethnicity within its borders, all 56, including 55 minorities. Arguably, activities like the Little Apple Dance are not intended to create more Han Chinese to turn Uyghurs into Chinese ethnically. It's not going to transform people's ethnicity. Instead, by training the body, by having people participate in these grand coordinated rituals that are meant to build a sense of community and perform that community, the government wants to transform bad citizens, liminal citizens, unreadable citizens into good citizens who perform as they expect and who do what they wish. The word is not Han. The word is Min, citizen or subject. It's just that the vast majority of Chinese officials, including the leaders of all critical offices in Xinjiang, are Han Chinese. And they proceed from a perspective that assumes that the practices of Han Chinese at the center of China in its most developed and peaceful areas, they assume that these practices are the norm. A good citizen looks like 
a cosmopolitan Eastern Han Chinese who loves China, who's modern forward thinking, and who consumes certain kinds of pop culture, particularly pop culture with no overt religious contents. Someone harmless like an auntie dancing in a square. Uyghurs especially have a threatening image in the popular Chinese imagination, Uyghur men especially. And there's been an attempt since the 1950s to transform the image of Uyghurs from one which is seen as threatening, masculine, knife-carrying, to one which is peaceful. Uh, representations of children and women are especially common, especially happy, dancing women and children. So the Little Apple Dance incident was a broad-ranging, coordinated attempt to do two things. One, to figure out who was unwilling to participate and thus defy the party. And two, to make Uyghurs, as imperfect citizens, act out normative Chineseness in public. Perhaps to transform their hearts and minds, perhaps to demonstrate that the government could do, make them do any ridiculous thing, perhaps in an earnest attempt to bring Uyghurs into contact with the government in a way that they might find fun. We have to allow for the possibility that people really thought that this would be fun. We all know what mandatory fun feels like, and yet we keep having mandatory fun in this world. So maybe all three. But I reject the proposition that the Little da Apple Dance incidents was mainly about fun, because it's one of a number of policies in effect in Xinjiang that we could accurately think of as biopolitical. That is, when I mean about biopolitical, it's a Foucauldian definition. These are strategies and mechanisms through which human life processes are managed under regimes of authority over knowledge, power, and the processes of subjectif uh, subjectif subjectification. There we go. So the idea is you know, biopolitics is about moving people around and making them function in certain ways, perform in certain ways. Since 2001, the PRC has introduced a number of measures meant to limit, for example, the scope of the use of the Uyghur language. Uyghur has been all but eliminated from the educational system. We knew, they knew this was a ridiculous idea because there weren't enough Mandarin-speaking teachers for the school system, and yet they went ahead and did it. Young students are regularly sent for middle school from Xinjiang to interior China, and what's called the, Han, uh, the Nedi Ban, the inner China class where they're isolated from their Uyghur community and expected to assimilate by making friends in high school, being immersed in Mandarin and in central Chinese culture. Under economic agreements between interior provinces and certain sub-regions of Xinjiang, whole villages are moved to the Chinese coast to work in factories. And as many of you have probably heard, traditional houses in the old city of Kashgar, some of them dating back 600 years, have been bulldozed en masse in the name of public safety and replaced with Chinese-style apartment blocks, altering the basic structures with which people are able to live their lives, shifting from movable adobe and wood walls in random configurations that emerged over time to simple, readable apartment blocks with impenetrable concrete walls. Now, they will paint them orange and add a little arched roof to some of the windows. That makes them ethnic. But apart from that, they're Chinese apartments. So there are a number of programs aimed at controlling, moving, and transforming Uyghur bodies. And perhaps most insidious, I think, and strange, uh, is called Project Beauty. It's a wonderfully Orwellian name. And I'll end with this. Um, in 2011, Xinjiang officials launched a campaign to pressure Uyghur women, specifically to stop wearing the veil and, quote, show their beauty to the world, unquote. Meanwhile, men in many areas uh, have been fined or even jailed for wearing beards. As you can see, this gentleman here has shaven his beard, and he's carrying a copy of the marriage law of the People's Republic of China. Um, of course, the image of a good Chinese man is one who has a hairless chin, like all the great communist leaders, who rejects long hair or beards as a relic of the old imperial society. But that was a Chinese political phenomenon. It wasn't a Uyghur political phenomenon until it was imposed by the CCP. For women, specifically, the idea is not to transform oneself from a Uyghur into a secular Han. To the contrary. The goal is to transform oneself, in, as shown in these propaganda images, from a dark, black-robed woman, here we go, uh, who is meant to be 
oppressed by the specter of Islam, here represented by, uh, for example, oh, there we go, seeing oneself as a face of, face of death in a mirror, or uh, being forced into a marriage in secret by an illegal imam. Um, but rather, for that woman to transform herself from a Muslim into an, an ethnic Uyghur by wearing colorful clothing. Remember the images earlier on of women dancing in bright, colorful silk dresses. These are considered acceptable ethnic wear. This is, from the perspective of the Chinese government, the correct way to be Uyghur. Not to be a Muslim wearing black, brown robes, whatever, has been worn, been worn in Xinjiang for centuries, but by conforming to a, a state media image of a beautiful, smiling, dancing, harmless, ethnic person. To be Muslim is to be oriented towards a different center of the world, towards another vast and rich culture, towards Mecca, towards other political centers. To be Uyghur is to accept a category produced by the state and to participate in that category. You do so by changing to brightly colored clothing or shaving your beard. And then, supposedly a Uyghur having done so, will come to realize their secular identity by acting it out, by changing their outward appearance. So when the Chinese government claims to be fighting extremism in the far west, we have to ask what they're actually fighting. The vast majority of official efforts to combat extremism involve changing people's physical appearances, controlling where they live and in what kinds of spaces, controlling what language they speak in public, and now controlling how they move in public and how they participate in public ritual. There's actually very little counter-terrorism work as we would typically think of it. For example, and we can talk about incentives in the Q&A, but a big part of the problem is the central government's willingness to fund the expansion and militarization of the security apparatus in Xinjiang, which gives local officials the license and the resources to act however they see fit, hence the role of sino-normativity in the implementation of policy. Local units are told to go find terrorism and destroy it. If you don't find it, you haven't met your quota. Most of the time, however, destroying terrorism means that they disrupt ordinary but technically illegal prayer meetings in people's homes. They bully, for example, this is a case in Aksu, they bully a religious family for two years and send them for long stays in re-education. And then they punish them for failing to attend something as seemingly innocuous as the Little Apple Dance. Uh, I was going to play myself out with a, a music video of the Xinjiang Special Forces uh, who made their own Little Apple video, but uh, there's no AV for that, so I'll conclude there. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I hope it's been in some way at least stimulating, and I'm looking forward to questions and comments. Thanks so much. So, start with you in the front. Sure. What, um, what changes have you seen in terms of the government's response since the riots in 2009? Mm. I mean, it, it seems like they went back to that strike hard philosophy in, in Xinjiang, uh, both in Rumshi and Kashgar. But I just. Mm -hmm. We expected a major change after 2009 because, broadly speaking, the. Um, uh, Wang Lechuan, the party secretary who'd been in charge in Xinjiang for much longer than normal, was considered to have been ineffective at his job. Uh, it was broadly realized that uh, the oppressive strategies adopted since, since 2001 were causing more discontent. Uh, and it was also clear after the riots that the Han Chinese in Xinjiang, who see themselves as the vanguard of the state, did not feel protected. We thought that Zhang Chunxian, the new party secretary, would change things. He didn't. You're right, they moved back to a strike hard stance for a long time. Um, things have eased off in about the past year to year and a half, in part because uh, after years of crying wolf over terrorism, Xinjiang finally started seeing some actual violent incidents which, we, which would conform to a definition of terrorism. Attacks on police stations, attacks in marketplaces, things like this. Uh, in the past year, year and a half, they've abandoned some of these policies that they realized were counterproductive on the ground level like uh, trying to ban religious gatherings. Uh, they realized that they were pushing people away from the party and towards Islamic extremism. The problem is, 
now they're still operating according to the same basic logic. So for example, where in Hotan, they were telling people they couldn't have r religious gatherings. Now they're saying that religious gatherings must involve a certain amount of dancing. And now they're prescribing ways of being religious, but they think we're going to push people towards moderate Islam. It's, it's been, it's invited less discontent than the previous set of policies, but I don't think it's going to help much in the long term. Does that answer your question? Please. Quick question. One is, what is the policy on the bright and colored clothing? Who mm. was that implemented? And the second one is, aren't they still doing things like forcing people to eat during Ramadan? Mm. Uh, so on both those points, the Project Beauty, Project Beauty began in 2011 officially. But in many ways, uh, in terms of the Chinese state's production of an image of Uyghur ethnicity, that has been present since the 1950s. Or actually, it has its roots in the 1930s under a period of Soviet dominance. So it's really been there for a long time. Um, but officially, the start was 2011. As for eating during Ramadan, this is mostly a problem in, the, in the schools and work units. Yeah. Uh, where, for example, in schools, Xinjiang University, Xinjiang Normal University, they will lock the gates and lock students in uh, and tell them that, no, you can't have a meal at the cafeteria after sundown. You're only getting breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and by the way, you have to report. So yeah, that policy is still in place. Um, it's not helping anything. Is it still in place in places like Xining? Um, Xining, not as much. Well, I'm not aware of it in Xining. I've never heard about it in Xining. It's a funny thing that when you describe policy in Xinjiang to people who work on Islam elsewhere in China, you don't see the same patterns of oppression or cultural censorship that you do in Xinjiang uh, for Hui Muslims or other Muslim groups like the Salars in Gansu. Uh, in some ways, Xinjiang's strategies of, uh, strategies of control um, are different even from those used in Tibet. It somehow turned into a very exceptional situation, which is actually, I, I didn't explain the term colonial, colonialism in the, I had in the title. Uh, Xinjiang has become the quintessential exception to the Chinese state system. It has become the thing that we always need to act on to assert the sovereignty of the Chinese state. It always has to have special policies, and that specialness is what motivates policy making and investment in the region. So there remains an incentive to use particularly extreme policies in the far Northwest. I hope that answers you. <laughs> okay, I think you were next. Uh, how long did you spend in Xinjiang and China, and what was the most interesting time you had for you? In total, I've had something like four years in China, just between a few long stays and various bits and pieces. In Xinjiang, I'd say a year and a half to two years. That included one year before the riots, uh, studying Uyghur at a university. Um, those were very different times before the 2009 riots. You could get Mongols, Uyghurs, Hui, Chinese, everyone around a table together. Um, things changed after that. What was most eye-opening? Now, I had studied Xinjiang's politics and history pretty intensively for two years before I went. And back before the riots, <coughs> there wasn't much penetration by Western media of the region. There wasn't a lot of coverage. And what there was was pretty thin. So a lot of my news came from the Uyghur diaspora organizations and from human rights groups, especially focused on Xinjiang. I think the biggest surprise when I got on the ground with a lot of assumption about what I was going to find in my year of studying and the sort of casual field work. And within about two weeks, I realized I had no idea. Life was way more complicated than I thought. The agency of people in Xinjiang is way more complicated than I realized. And I had to rethink the whole thing. Um, there is a lot, people try to control the narrative around Xinjiang pretty tightly, both the Chinese government and the diaspora groups, and they tend to present very, very simplistic uh, images and narratives that simply are not borne out on the ground. That was the biggest shock to me, but that was also a long time ago. Uh, yes, please. Um, this may take you kind of off the subject, but I'm curious what the major differences are between uh, the actions of the Chinese central government in Xinjiang and Tibet. Uh, and obviously there's 
huge cultural differences. But are, are, there, are there parallels? Or is it or are each, the, each situation is just so unique that you know, you want to, I'm, I'm thinking about the kind of importation of Han Chinese and the, the kind of deep Tibetanization of Tibetan. So I just read a wonderful edited volume called, um, I think it's, this, I can't, I'm bad with titles, uh, Benjamin Hillman and Gray Tuttle edited, edit, Tuttle edited it, and it's called uh, Protest and Discontent in Xinjiang and Tibet. And it's a wonderful piece of uh, sort of volume of social science and ethnographic work that really does bring the two regions together. Um, both of them are autonomous regions that have had their promise of autonomy betrayed, essentially by government policies, right, through mass immigration, of Chinese from the, from the center who are thought to be the vanguard of construction of a new frontier. What's really interesting about both of these regions is that the discontent that you see, and the policy implementation you see, is not necessarily on the level of the autonomous region. It varies significantly from locality to locality within. And so actually it's better to compare a county in Xinjiang with a county in a Tibetan area and see if policies play out similarly there. Um, what really binds these two areas together in a interesting way, is uh, the idea of developing the West, the great opening up of the West, and the government's, the central government's willingness to pour money into infrastructure projects in Tibet and Xinjiang, both to link those regions with China proper, in the case of Xinjiang, to link it more directly with Central Asia. Uh, Xinjiang on that point, I think one of the reasons for the heavy securitization of Xinjiang is that it's a relatively open space. If you're Pakistani, you can go to certain parts of Xinjiang without a visa, for example, because it's such a critical space for trade, whereas Tibet, they can cut off much more easily in a separate visa regime. Um, <coughs> what's really similar is that the central government hands all this money to local officials to build big, shiny development projects, build this road, then build it again next year, build it with an extra lane the next year. Um, and these projects incentivize local officials to make up reasons why they need more development money or more money for security, leading them to grow exceptionally powerful at the local level. They rarely listen to local concerns because all they need to do is build more stuff. And through the power of graft, they will manage to enrich themselves and their, uh, their own networks of relationships. So I think that's what's really interesting about the similarities between the two regions. Um, I hope that answers your question. Please. That's a great question. So often in Xinjiang, uh, the head of a given section, like the head of government or the head of the party, will be Uyghur, but their deputy will be Han. And it's generally acknowledged that the deputy has the power and that the Uyghur is the figurehead. Uh, China learned from the Soviet Union's example. The Soviet Union gave much greater autonomy to its autonomous republics, and the governments of those tended to be staffed by members of the titular nationality. Well, in China, these leaders circulate around the country much more, and uh, China prevents them from developing local power bases. It's generally acknowledged, yeah, that true power lies with Han Chinese officials. Which is to say, and this is a very important point, one of the reasons there's so much discontent in these regions is that the Chinese government has refused to build a path for interpreting the popular sentiment or will of Uyghurs or Tibetans. They've, there's no leadership that grows organically out of, out of the population. Please. Can I switch to the topic of economic development? Sure. Um, so in this rapid strategy for development, so, to what extent do the Uyghurs benefit from that? Or do they participate? Or are they sidelines? They're sidelines. They're absolutely sidelined for various reasons. This has been the case since the 1950s. One, there's a basic prejudice on the part of the people who run these projects, who are Han Chinese, to think that Uyghurs are lazy, unemployable, where there's the excuse they don't speak Mandarin Chinese. So, therefore, how could we possibly employ them? The other problem is that this development money filters down to local officials who then uh, partner with local enterprises and local entrepreneurs who are again Han because, say, the local party leader and the head of this construction company are both from the same place in Sichuan. They'll know each other, right? They'll have a Guanxi network. 
That means that employers who receive this kind of money and who are benefiting from the uh, frontier economy developed, that's been produced in the West aren't inclined to hire Uyghurs either. If they do, Uyghurs tend to be hired at entry-level positions, doing very menial labor that does not make them a part of the broader company or part of the broader economy. They don't get to advance through the company. So <laughs> there is all sorts of active discrimination. Uh, never mind that it's actually legal to post a job ad saying Han Chinese only. So yeah, this is a main source of discontent. People see these shiny infrastructure projects going up. They, say that, uh, they see that the state wants them to be grateful for this infrastructure, and yet they don't benefit economically. Um, have, have there been changes in the, the last uh, few years, or perhaps since 2009, uh, in the attitudes of uh, Islamist groups in Pakistan or neighboring uh, areas of Xinjiang uh, that, that indicate a, a greater desire to, to promote that cause within the, the Uyghurs? So, we probably all know about the number of Uyghurs who were stuck in Guantanamo Bay after being picked up in Afghanistan during the Afghan war early on. I mean, those were mainly economic migrants trying to make their way to Turkey. We also now know that there are a number of Chinese Muslims who have ended up in ISIS, the Islamic State. We have some of their uh, recruitment records. They still follow a similar pattern. You know, they were looking to get to Turkey. They're hoping to see cousins in Saudi Arabia. They're looking for work. They're not necessarily ideologues. That said, since I'd say about 2007, uh, Central Asian and Pakistani Islamist groups have been trying to recruit Uyghurs and to build a base of support in Xinjiang. I remember translating back in 2007, 2008, this awful video uh, in somewhere in northern Pakistan it was a film of a, a Pakistani man bursting into a, a dormitory where some Chinese laborers were working at a tricycle factory and shooting them to death. And it was all subtitled in Uyghur and saying, you know, this is our jihad, carry it on in eastern Turkestan. This has not been very effective on the ground. Now, uh, clearly, the number of Uyghurs interested in Islamic extremism or in Salafism has increased significantly over the past several years. This is apparent if you go to Xinjiang, you meet people who, say, studied in Saudi Arabia or went to Syria, they come back and they admire what they saw there, and they think that maybe that's what they would like. It's also evident when some people try to get out of China, either because they are seeking a better life economically or because they generally feel oppressed, you know, uh, on their way out through the Golden Triangle, trying to get smuggled out of the region. Um, they tend to hit, link up with Islamist groups. Okay. Um, but I just don't think that this has posed the systematic threat that the Chinese state claims it does. They've been claiming for years that outside forces in Pakistan are trying to uh, radicalize Uyghurs on the ground. It's not happened on, uh, to a significant extent. Which I hope is accurate. Uh, yes, please. Um, to what extent has um, China used Trump's anti-Muslim rhetoric for their own purposes? China is very, very good at working with international sentiment. They don't need to work with Trump's rhetoric because they've been working with, frankly, American rhetoric since 2001, when after September 11th, they took advantage of a global moment of terrorism to label essentially any anti-government organization or protest in the far west terrorist activity. It even made up a terrorist group, uh, which the United States State Department readily accepted the reality of. Um, I haven't heard them respond at all to Trump's anti-Muslim rhetoric, because I think they have a lot else to respond to in terms of uh, China's position in, uh, in Asia and the Pacific, and the advantages that many commentators in China see to having a weaker, more erratic presidency in the U.S. Not my words, their words. Just want to indicate I'm not proselytizing here. So I haven't seen anything new. I recently saw headlines about people in Xinjiang having returned their passports. <laughs> yes. Um, can you just talk about your interpretation of that and what are the, kind of, what's the stated goal by the government and what, how people are responding? Okay, so this is 
to my memory, the third time there's been a mass passport seizure, seizure in Xinjiang. I remember the first time, I remember a friend of mine who regularly went back and forth to Kazakhstan to see her fiance. Uh, it's a you know, perfectly ordinary Kazakh, international, spoke fluent Chinese. She had to turn her passport. And she couldn't go to Kazakhstan anymore. She's like, well, I bought my ticket. What am I supposed to do? It's a major inconvenience for people. The second time around, a couple of years ago, they started seizing more passports from border areas. And now it looks like they're going to take everyone's passport again. They hold it for you at the police station. And you have to go and give them a good reason to get it. <laughs> What's the point? Well, OK, one, obviously, this is a way of controlling movement across China's borders. But there are other ways you could do that, right? I mean, you could station people at border check posts and have them link to a common database, have a no-fly list, have a, you know, a no-border crossing list. So why are we consolidating them all at the center? It's weird. What I think it is is this. Now, in this latest wave of passport seizures, and this gets back to the question of biopolitics. The Xinjiang state is now requiring people who want to travel abroad and get a passport to submit extensive biometric data. Measurements of their bodies, uh, 3D images of themselves, probably a cheek swab. God knows what else they're asking for these days. <coughs> Why? What I think is this. I think this is superfluous use of technology because they have the money to do it. And they can claim it's all for the benefit of securitization. It's the same process I was describing in Tibet and Xinjiang, where the government is happy to give out money for infrastructure and security in this supposedly wild, uncontrollable northwestern border region. Uh, that, that's basically it. It's security theater. It's uh, the ability, it's, it's giving local officials the ability to purchase fancy new toys and make some money in the process. I think that has a lot to do with it. Are there any other questions, comments? Uh, also, critiques and confusion are good, too. So. Yeah, just a kind of a larger perspective on uh, Xinjiang. You know, the Chinese government's not stupid. Is, is, do you think their, their, their plan is to just push as many Han into Xinjiang that it won't matter what happens with the leaders, or do they really just not care that there's no political avenues for uh, expressing thought and uh, culture? The Chinese government isn't stupid. And I don't think it's malicious either, or at least not intentionally. I genuinely, I, I reject analyses that boil this down to Han officials being mean-spirited. That might be true on a micro level. But I think systemically, like you're asking about, yeah, the Chinese government isn't stupid. But they might be deeply misguided. Um, the goal is indeed to flood Xinjiang with as many uh, economic pioneers as possible. You, know, you see, when there's a protest event in somewhere like Aksu, a few months later, suddenly a few thousand more Han Chinese show up to help balance out the population. Uh, for a long time, the government really saw Han Chinese as a civilizing, stabilizing influence in the borderlands. Now, they might be realizing now that's not necessarily the case, because again, in 2009, the riots in Urumqi were then followed by riots several orders of magnitude larger on the part of Han Chinese citizens who are supposed to be the government's friends, the government's vanguard in the region. At least that's how they see themselves. They might be reinterpreting that now, but migration has not stopped, despite the tremendous pressure it puts on natural resources. Is there still an effort to uh, export Uyghur women to other parts of the country? Yeah. Now that's still a thing. Um, you might remember the shooter, the shooter toy factory incident, which preceded the uh, 2009 riots. Um, when large numbers of Uyghurs were housed in a dormitory in Guangdong, in Guangzhou, in fact, to uh, end up in a riot with Han Chinese in another dormitory. They are still doing these mass labor transfer programs. My question is, is it really targeting Uyghur women specifically? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, it's not abnormal, as you know by looking at any Chinese factory, for them to prefer young women from the countryside as workers. These just happen to be Uyghur. That's a lot of this. A lot of this is economic. People just happen to be Uyghur. That has a new dimension to the economic inequalities. Um, Uyghur nationalists tend to interpret this as uh, a way of taking our women away and polluting them with Chineseness, or giving them the, the chance to be violated sexually by Han Chinese men, which is a whole different conversation there, the gendering of Uyghur nationalism. Um, Despite these difficulties, uh, the program does persist. I think in part because many poor Uyghur villages 
see these as opportunities to significantly enrich their economies by linking themselves directly with a much higher paying uh, region on the East Coast. Terry. Um, a lot of people have talked about how the new Silk Road stuff yeah. could potentially be a two-way street, right? I mean, we know that it's vehicle for Chinese investment and diplomatic control and all that stuff. Um, it seems, though, that they've been able to control any influx going the other direction. Is that what you see? I mean, I don't, like, you don't see large numbers of people from Central Asia mm -hmm. um, coming into China as a, as a result of presumably this old, new open, right? I mean, I don't follow it, so I don't well, you do, actually. It's a funny thing. Um, Central Asia, well, first of all, Central Asians are already a major presence in Xinjiang. I mean, Urumqi is China's fifth largest port. And there's a whole area of town which is full of Central Asians. Uh, every year, regional universities host hundreds of Central Asian students studying Chinese or other topics. Uh, we already, there are already extensive exchange with Pakistan and Afghanistan in Xinjiang. And then, yeah, Central Asian traders do get to the coast. Uh, but they tend to focus on economic hubs like Guangzhou. So they follow the same routes as, as Uyghur traders do. Guangzhou, train straight to Urumqi, then hook up with factories in Central Asia or further west. They, they are there. I think they are taking advantage of this. Um, that said, I don't have numbers. Uh, obviously, Central Asian countries are much, much smaller than China. So proportionally, we would expect numbers of Central Asians in China to be smaller overall than Chinese going abroad. Because China really does have the labor surplus that allows them to send, say, a thousand construction workers to Africa. Right. Please. What do you see for the future? You ask the big questions. I like that. Uh, what do I see for the future? Yes. In Xinjiang. In the mountain, or on you know, the whole world? That's, this is, no, this is a really good question, and I don't have a clear answer. Uh, no one really saw the 2009 riots coming. I'm not sure what's going to happen next either, in part because information is so tightly controlled. What I do see is that there's going to be uh, a relaxation of these sorts of cultural assimilation programs, because I think the government is realizing that they're not working very well. Nevertheless, the educational system is already in place. You know, they're already imposing Mandarin language in an in institutional, systematic manner across the region. Um, I think that economic inequalities between Chinese migrants and Uyghurs in Xinjiang will continue, and they'll probably follow the same trend that we see more broadly in China of the widening wealth gap, except for those Uyghurs who are able to access Chinese networks. And those would be people who are very very well uh, socially or culturally acclimatized to Chinese life. Their numbers may increase if this educational program succeeds. There may be an increasing number of children who are fluent enough in Mandarin and who navigate, who perform in proper Han Chinese manners that they will be able to use that to their economic advantage. That's hard to say. I'm sorry, I wish I had a crystal ball. <laughs> Although I will say this, I think that um, Given the recent reconfiguration of China's internal sort of military structure, I think that China believes that Xinjiang is now essentially locked down for them. That they've pretty much solved the problem of cross-border movements and of how to shut down any kind of mass demonstration or mass violence that might occur. Uh, this is one of the reasons we've seen more Uyghurs leaving China not over Central Asia, but through Southeast Asia, because I think that their borders are now effectively secure. Oh, uh, uh, Emily Wilcox at University of Michigan. Let me find the title for you. Revolutionary Bodies. There's, there's going to be a whole new wave of uh, PRC history, and a big chunk of it is this interesting stuff about theater, dance, and uh, the ways in which uh, officials and people used culture in the early years of the PRC. We saw it when we lived in Beijing. We saw it in the schools. I mean, they have great school kids out doing these dances all the time to 
to the tune of Christmas carols. I don't know what oh, right, saying, yeah. But, but, <laughs> but to the tune of Christmas carols doing all these nationalistic dances. We're getting a big apple dance. Oh, gosh. I don't know what they moved on to now. Yeah, Christmas carols. Yeah. Well, it shows you a kind of weird pastiche that has turned into elite culture in eastern China. And to be properly Chinese is to engage, engage in this kind of cosmopolitan bricolage of signs and symbols and stuff that might index to us Christmas time, Christianity perhaps, and to someone else simply mean internationalism, good taste dance music, hence sinonormativity. All of these build into that intuitive sense of what it means to be Chinese. Uh, I don't know what time we're at exactly at this point. Is it OK, four up. You probably have time for one more, if anyone's still curious. Or if you're awfully tired of me, that's OK, too. <laughs> All right. And a few years ago, there was talk about China building a, a railroad from Xinjiang into Afghanistan yeah. to access their mineral wealth, and I, and I didn't follow that. Whatever happened? It's not built yet, but they're working on it. I know that after, uh, during the Afghan war, China was one of the first powers to sweep in and start buying up mineral rights in Afghanistan. I don't know what they're using to move the stuff right now, but I know that they're sponsoring infrastructure projects in Tajikistan that would probably help them move that more easily into their borders. I don't know. Listen, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and your sitting through this.